All right, folks, tonight on the Sunday Sipper Club, we are looking at some wines that you may not have heard about, but you'll definitely want to try this holiday season. I'm talking about raw or natural sherry. It's making a comeback. Yes. Um, Frankie Accorda. You know Prosecco, but do you know Frankie Accorda as a, an Italian sparkling wine? Or how about Pisco? the grape-based distilled spirit from Chile or Peru. All kinds of wonderful treats for your palate this holiday season. I'm Natalie McLean, editor of Canada's largest wine review site, and we gather here on the Sunday Sipper Club every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern, that's Toronto, New York time, to talk to the most interesting people in the world of wine. Now, before I introduce my guest fully, I would love to know in the comments, where are you logging in from? What's in your glass, if anything yet? Uh, what's the weather like? As you know, I'm obsessed with weather and I'm going to click into our Facebook here and see who is online. Um, so let me just make some adjustments here. And my group, there you are. Okay, good evening, Paul and Patty from Virginia. Lori's here from Ottawa. Um, all right, you guys are coming in quick. So let me uh, get on to our guest. Hello, Elaine Bruce. Um, very special guest tonight. So our guest this evening uh, has taught uh, literature at York University where she uh, got her PhD. And she also writes about wine and spirits for the Globe and Mail, Canada's largest newspaper. And she also contributes to the Toronto Star, the Report on Business Magazine, The Grid, and has won a National Magazine Award for her work. She is the author of Mondo Cocktail, a Shaken and Stirred History. And she has written a six-part podcast series for Wondery's American History Tellers. Her most recent book is America Walks Into a Bar, a spirited history of taverns and saloons, speakeasies, and grog shops, published by Oxford University Press. And she, got, she joins me now, live from her home in Toronto. Welcome to the Sunday Sipper Club. Hello, Christine Sismondo. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm great, thanks. thanks, Christine. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight. This is um, great. Thanks for having me. Technology is great, isn't it? Yeah. Especially when it works. <laughs> so, so many questions to ask you, Christine, but I want to kick it off with what was it like at the family dinner table while you were growing up? What was happening? What was on the table? Who was there? Ah, that's interesting. You know, I actually grew up in Ottawa um, in uh, the Westboro neighborhood. I don't know exactly how far that is from you. I live in Westboro. Come on, really? Really? Yes. <laughs> Where are your people? Which street? <laughs> what is it? We were on Churchill Avenue. I live on Churchill. No, you do not. We didn't plan this. That's amazing. I live on Churchill. My goodness. Do you know Holy where Claire, Claire is? You know, Churchill and Claire? But yeah, anyway. up the way. Yeah. yeah. So my goodness. That's right about there. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to go find your people after this. But anyway, carry on. <laughs> this is weird. I mean, in a good way. <laughs> that's really weird. Wow. So, yeah. Okay. Anyhow, um, uh, I, uh, my parent, my father, though, is an Italian, and he grew up in Argentina. And, you know, when we were living on Churchill Avenue in Westboro, um, there was a real shortage of things that he really wanted to eat and drink all the time because, and before that, we were actually in New Brunswick. And um, if he was having trouble in Ottawa, imagine the trouble he was having in New Brunswick. So he would sort of do his best to, you know, source things out from the Byward Market and places like that. But but really, um, he, we had to make a lot of our own stuff. We had a garden plot, we grew a lot of our own eggplant, zucchini, and my parents even made their own wine for a while. Not very good wine, I'll tell you, but wine nonetheless. So I had an early sort of glimpse into the life I wanted to lead. Oh, wow. So um, did, did you, you tasted wine as a child then and grew up with it? Yeah, I think we had we had wine, not um, a whole lot. I wouldn't have had very much when I was a kid. I think I probably didn't even really like the taste of it when I was young. I think that was sort of self-enforcing. Um, but I don't recall it being really uh, restrictive. Wow. Yeah. And so where did you get your taste for wine and other beverages, alcoholic? 
How did that happen? Well, I think it just seemed to me like a normal part of eating growing up. You know, I mean, my dad, sort of an old school uh, Latin American now, you know, in Argentina, he, he all drink a little glass of wine with his lunch, you know, um, and still does, right? right. Um, yeah, and I know that I kind of look at it and think, well, it's way too early for that. But that's just, you know, the way that it was more like food. Right, exactly. Yeah. And you wrote a piece for the Globe Mail on... Um, the Katena family, Dr. Laura mm -hmm. Katena, who has been on the Sunday Sipper Club show in the past. Wow. Wonderful wines. Yeah. So she's so impressive. She's an emergency room doctor in her spare time. She's vice president of the family winery. Um, but what what uh, was your focus there? What was the story there on the Katenas? Well, you know, in some ways, because I've always written a lot about spirits as well as wines, and I, I kind of write more about spirits and drink more wine is kind of the way it tends to go. And my parents have always been really big, especially my dad, about trying to get me into wine and to like wine so much. And and I, I love it, but I, the culture of it, I, I've never really connected with. But at Katana, I could not believe the experience that I got there in terms of understanding the soil structure and the difference that it made to the different wines. And we got to go through the vineyards and try the stones and bones, um, the two Chardonnays and, that are from, you know, they're really just like 14 feet away from each other, but because they've dug down and seen which, which soils are rocky and which ones are sandy, they can tell like that they're going to taste as much difference. And then you taste them, they're right in the fields. And you're like, wow, I have seen the light. You're right. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah, she is a scientist by nature. I mean, not just a doctor, but they like her father, who also has a doctorate or doctor, um, they study the soils, you know, almost pebble by pebble and mm -hmm. are doing these small lots and everything else. I mean, it's just amazing what they've done as a family for viticulture in Argentina. Yeah, it's really impressive. And I couldn't believe, um, you know, really how visual it was and how because you can actually look down and see all the different types of soils. I was really blown away by that. Wow, that's fantastic. All right. So I'm going to just nip back into the comments here and uh, welcome more folks who are joining us now. Elaine Bruce is in Mexico. All right. Ooh. Normally you're in Calgary, Elaine. So welcome from a warmer place. Heidi Messenger is from Toronto. Lori Sweet is here in uh, from a cool and damp Kingston. Oh, yes, I asked about weather. Um, Beverly is here from Southern California. Alejandra Smith is here. Alejandra, remind, Alejandra, remind me where you are from, um, where you're logging in from. Linda Michaels is here from Pennsylvania. Anne McLean is in soggy, cold, and wet Halifax. <laughs> Uh, Jason Davies is in London, UK. Jason is a trooper because it's midnight there, something like that, time-wise. Mm -hmm. um, Lori says, hello, Christine. And let me just toggle down. Anne Bedard is here from Panama. Douglas Trapasso, where are you logging in from? And Thomas Schoen, Thomas Schoen from Toledo, Ohio, across mm -hmm. from the wonderful wineries on Lake Erie's North Shore in Essex County, Ontario. Mm -hmm. Cheers, he says hello. Uh, Christine oh, Alejandro is here from Chile. Oh. And, yeah, we're going to talk about Pisco, Alejandra. So, and Peter Nielsen is here from Windsor, Ontario, where it's eight degrees. So now we're all up to date on the weather. <laughs> if you guys have <laughs> just joined us, please log in. I love to know who's here. What's in your glass? What's the weather? All right. So um, moving on then, Christine, we, I would love to start with, uh, so you've highlighted for me some of your favorite wine stories that you uh, wrote in the Globe and Mail uh, in 2018. Let's start with the sparkling wines from Italy that we don't know. We all know about Prosecco and of course Champagne from France, but what is one of the two um, sparkling wines that we don't know about so much from Italy? Um, you know, and it's really interesting because I think that a lot of people believe that Cava is what you call champagne from Spain and Prosecco is what you call champagne. I mean, I realize it's not champagne, but mm -hmm. um, from, from Italy. And of course it's not because, you know, these are highly regional places with big differences between how they make things from one region to the next and um, with huge grape varietal differences. So um, the two that I wrote about are Lambrusco and Franciacorta, but of course there are others as well. 
Um, those that happen all, also to be my two favorite. Hmm. Okay, let's start with Lambrusca, which had a mm -hmm. very nasty reputation uh, back in the, I guess, 60s or 70s. Why was that? Yeah, if you talk to people of a certain age and they can remember when it went out, then they are not eager to have that ever again. And then you have to tell them, no, it's really a different Lambrusco than what you were drinking um, because we have a, a sort of more good stuff coming over. But in the 19, um, uh, early, in the late 70s and early 1980s, it if you look at the top 10 best-selling wines in the United States, there's a New York Times list on it. I think it's something like four or six of them are Lambruscos. So it was this wildly popular wine among um, Americans, you know, sort of all throughout the 70s and early 1980s. Um, not all of it was that good, though. <laughs> no. Yes. <laughs> you hesitate. Why wasn't it good? Like, what did it taste like and why was it not that great? Well, I think the, the predominant feature would be just that it was really too sweet for the large part. Um, uh, you know, we th there's so many different types of Lambrusco now, as there were then and before that. But the one that was coming over to North America was sold for $2 a bottle, which is, of course, more, you know, that's not, it's not two buck chuck exactly. It's better than that. Um, but um it, it was really an affordable price point for baby boomers who were just starting to learn how to drink wine, but it was sweet, it was syrupy, it was made generally in Charmat tanks, which is a large scale method of doing the secondary fermentation. And, um, and it was really just not of a, a great quality. It would have tasted a little like a, a grape pop. Oh, with like a soda pop, like sweet cherry pop. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because so, it is a red sparkling wine, right? Oh, yes. I should have said that right off oh, the top. Okay. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people are are really turned off by that, even now. I, I know I told my sister-in-law, you got to go get this Lambrusco. It's at the LCBO right now. I always sort of send out alerts when I see things that I love. Oh. And she got there and then she said, oh, it's the red. And she walked away from it, didn't buy it. And then she came over to my house another time later and I, and she tried it and she was like, oh, I was so wrong. I should have bought this. Excellent. Good case study. Uh, and it's festive. So I think on the holidays, during the holidays, we should try a red sparkler. I mean, what the hey? Um, Shiraz, sparkling Shiraz is in that category, at least color wise, but very, very different uh, production methods. Yeah. So you said the Charmat method. Uh, that is kind of like in a big tank, the second fermentation versus in champagne, it's the second fermentation that gets the bubbles. It happens in the bottle, right? Exactly. And that was some of the the sort of the, the thing that made Lambrusco, the wine of that era, had a lot to do with the fact that there was this collective of winemakers who got together in Italy. And this is after the country is just been, has been devastated by war. They're in a total depression. Everybody is absolutely flat broke, but everybody is sort of looking for how are we going to embrace this post-war age? So um, they they pooled together, they formed collectives, and they invested in technology for creating the wine, and then also for marketing it and for storage. And together, this group of, of um, wine producers, they united, and that's what Rioniti means in English, is united. Wow. And and they pooled their resources and they put they made this wine and then they marketed it to the United States and it did fantastically well. Hmm. So they dialed up the sugar, they had an easy production method, low cost of production. Did they do anything else? How did they market it so that it got such great penetration into the market here? They they were really smart about it. First of all, I think that they they tweaked the flavor profile of Lambrusco so that it would be sweet for very young people who were just learning to, to like wine. So people didn't have to deal with a very challenging palate. And second of all, they went to TV and they advertised it on TV. And they actually used um, the tune from, I think it was a Howdy Doody intro. And then they sort of superimposed these words, uh, you know, about, I can't remember exactly what they are now, I'm sorry. But um, if anyone ever wants to, they can contact me and I'll find the exact lyrics because they're fantastic. So it was a very like, you know, um, young upbeat. adult, poppy, upbeat sort of song that would remind people of their childhood watching Howdy Doody. Huh. And that was the advertising campaign at first. 
wow, that's like Ratatouille. Yeah. All the memories go back to childhood, and it's that you know that connecting memory that sets off the whole uh, series of associations. Yeah, that's amazing. So, mm -hmm. um, and just we're going to continue this discussion because um, I definitely want to talk about why it's trending now again. But I do want to take a moment, folks, to tell you if you're enjoying this conversation, take a moment to share. Uh, so hit that share button like what you're seeing on your screen now. And um, even better, uh, tell your friends and followers why they would want to tune into this, whether they catch us now live or on the replay. As you know, at the end of every chat, I always draw for a winner. So we will be drawing from, for a winner from last week's chat uh, at the end of this show. Um, Christine has generously agreed to uh, award a signed copy of her book if you share this video. So we'll draw that next week. So if you're watching the replay, you still have a chance to win that. And as always, if you want to take your wine knowledge to the next level, you can join me on an online video class for free at nataliemcclain.com forward slash pro and we go over how to taste like a pro all right so christine back to lambrusca so that was reunite 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 um united yeah so how did the lambrusca then evolve so it had this trench this foothold in the 60s and 70s then i guess i would assume it fell out of favor being sweet and but what's happened to the method to the mm. style and why is it making a comeback now I mean, I think that there's probably Reuniti being sold in a lot of places still. Um, but, you know, in the, the sort of more rarefied wine circles, um, nobody is really going to buy that at this point. But there are a number of producers who have decided that um, they have abandoned the Charmat tanks and they've gone back to the older methods from before and they're doing a secondary fermentation in the bottle. Um, it costs a little bit more than um, the two buck chuck, um, of course, but um, there's such a wide range of these fresh and delicious wines that you can have. And I mean, that I've never tasted quite the range of, of flavors in anything other than Lambrusco because there's everything from the, the palest pink, you could almost mistake it for a Brut Rosé, um, a cava perhaps all the way over to like this you know really thick and and grapey sort of foamy um something that could be like a um a lambic beer you know it's right. just a huge range of things going on wow that is mm -hmm. diverse um and lots more comments here let's just uh acknowledge some of those douglas is uh in chicago just back got back from connecticut Neil Phillips is here from Toronto. He's drinking a 2015 French Merlot in the glass oh. and says, welcome, Christine. Um, Lambrusco times 100 makes happiness. I think that's what the emojis are saying. I'm not sure. Um, Lori Kilmartin says, I had a sparkling wine from Verdicchio, from the Verdicchio grape and just came back from Frankia Corda region last week. Oh. I love Frankia Corda. We're going to get to that, Lori, in a moment. So great. I'm glad you can chime in on that. Um, she also had a, a Cro Croatina Bonarda in Lombardy, where they make a frizzante style. And then uh, Paul Hollander says, ah, Rioniti, remember it well from the 70s. Do you still have a headache, Paul? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Peter Nielsen uh, in uh, Windsor, Lombrusco in university in the late 60s, right up there with sweet cherry whiskey, never again. But it's come a <laughs> long way, as have you, Peter. <laughs> Jennifer Pavry from Toronto is drinking a fabulous red from Argentina, Malbec. Yeah. D.E. Angeles, 2013, bought from Buenos Aires by, oh, she brought to her from Buenos Aires from her daughter. Miguel Borgia has joined us. Nancy McLean. Hi, Natalie. I'm joining from Bedeck. Would you happen to know where that is? My parents are from Quebec. Oh, sorry. Bedeck. Good Lord. <laughs> um, nicer here than in Halifax. I'll be heading there tomorrow. Hope you're doing well. Hi, Nancy. Great to hear from you. Jim Clark from Canada. Hi there. Uh, Miguel Borgia is joining us from Portugal. Uh, Neil Phillips says, Rio 90 on ice. So nice. Oh, yes, Paul. I remember too. Lynn, Lynn Vanderlyn has joined. 
Um, Charlotte Cadieu has joined, and Neil says, I pu just pulled up the Reunited commercial from 1983 on YouTube. Oh. I don't think I'll get that tune out of my head for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Paul says, I prefer to call headaches, those headaches, a sinus headache, quote unquote. Okay. All right. So I've, I've even lost track where we were, Christine, because it's, I love the comments here. So with mm -hmm. um, Lambrusca, so it's now more modern, more diverse. Um, you were saying in your article, there's just so many grapes that are used, so many yeasts. I mean, how do we keep track of it all? It sounds a little intimidating for what used to be a simple drink, now very modern in style and a sommelier darling. It sounds a little intimidating, mm -hmm. is it? I, well, you know, I guess you could if you wanted to catalog everything. I'm sort of not, I'm not really methodical in my approach to wine in that I don't, you know, keep track. I don't have, um, you know, a notebook with scores or anything like that. I just, I just drink it. So, uh -huh. <laughs> so, and I try, and if things are fantastic, then I remember them and I remember sort of the general story. And then I, and then I don't worry about being intimidated by things because, you know, and, and the, and the great thing about Lambrusco in terms of the intimidation factor is that they're really meant to be unpretentious. Drink them now, drink them up like immediately. Like they even, a lot of them have a, a metal cap instead of a full cork. Some of, you know, there's a little bit of a range on terms of how they're packaged, but they're meant to be the kind of wine you stick under your arm and you go on the picnic and you just pop it open and drink it it's a drinker not a thinker i guess is the, the oh, word i like I'm that doing, there's a right? good tagline someone yeah. should use that <laughs> that's great yeah. all right let's talk about the other italian sparkling that you've written about in the globe mail and that is i don't know if i'm pronouncing it correctly but frankie corda so you might be right different? i call it french accorta um french but Accorda. but you might be right i'm not really 100 percent positive my dad did not teach me enough italian Oh, well, that's okay. You, you've well made up for that deficit in your education. So maybe differentiate Franciacorta from Lambrusco and from Prosecco. Like, let's situate it. What What is it like and how is it different? So now we're back to a white sparkling. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, without uh, Prosecco is obviously extraordinarily successful because it is really easy drinking. Um, and I find it a little bit sweet. Um, and I tend to personally, I would opt for a, a cava made according to the traditional method with the secondary fermentation in the bottle over a uh, Prosecco. And um, it's not that I have any kind of prejudice against a different type of method exactly. Um, it's just that I find that flavor has driven me in that direction. And the flavor of Franciacorta, again, drives me right to it every single time. I think it's just a really elegant, um, uh, you know, I don't want to compare it to champagne, champagne because I believe that they should be all judged according to their own standards. But um, of course it is in that direction in that it's dry. The bubbles are really fine. The, the flavor is really elegant and perfect. And um, you don't kind of get that. The Glera grape to me has a little bit of sweetness that, that, I, um, that I find a little less uh, palatable than the, the grape mix that's being used for French Accorta. And Glera being the grape used for Prosecco. Yes, yeah, sorry, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's good. Um, so why is Frankie Corda then more expensive? You're, you're alluding to it, but it, are there some core things that they do making Frankie Corda that um, do add cost to the process? Yeah, so as I understand it, not all Prosecco is Charmat method, but the vast majority of it is. Okay. So there are some exceptions to that. Whereas with the French Accorta, there is no Charmat being used whatsoever it's um as far as i understand i i haven't you know been everywhere um so the that but i believe that's one of the features that um that you can qualify for the doc is that you're using you're making it in this sort of very specific way so just the time alone is a big deal and then in addition there's the risk which is that a secondary fermentation in the bottle is not necessarily always going to go well there, you can buy a riddling machine, of course, but some people are hand riddling all of the bottles, you know, in certain cases. And so um, I, I think that that is those are the reasons um, why it's a much more expensive wine. Hmm. It's, 
Yeah. But go ahead. Yes. Yeah, no. I was going to say there was a Bella Vista here, I think, yes. in the summer, and it was around $42, um, yeah. something in that neighborhood. I, I can't yes. remember exactly. Um, uh, and again, you'd hate to just compare things to champagne because it's just really the wrong way to go. Right. But you could, you could definitely tell people it was a champagne and they would be happy. And some people would say that it has a different flavor profile and expresses the terroir of the region in a much different way than champagne. Some people would probably like it much better. Yeah, absolutely. So we don't get many of these wines, the Frankie Corda, in our liquor stores across the country. No, Italian sparkling wine, aside from Prosecco, is rare. Mm. This year, uh, there were a few Lambruscos, which I was really happy to see. Um, and I bought a lot of them. And uh, I think there's a Trento in um, the LCBO right now. And then there was a French Accorta, at least one this summer. And other than that, it's private import. Wow. Okay. So we got to snap them up when we see them, at least if we want to try them. Yes. All right. And so do you think the food pairings would be any different for, I mean, what would you, what would be your ideal pairing if you could choose anything for a Lambrusco, a modern style Lambrusco and a Frankie Corda? I think that um, the Lambrusco is like extraordinarily food friendly because the acidity is really quite high. Yeah. So um, you could go anywhere from uh, Christmas turkey to um, uh, salumi or, you know, the sort of uh, crudo kind of, um, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, yeah. the, yeah, the antipasto with the heavy meats, you know, the lardo and the salami and um, the nice hams, the prosciutto. It's perfect. I've had it with sausages on the barbecue. I mean, it's just such a good wine for food. Hmm. Um, and then, you know, the same holds true with any white sparkling that it holds up against a lot of different things. But with a French Accorta, um, I'd be more inclined to pair it with something like a, a fish, a smoked salmon, a ceviche, all of those things would work out, I think, really well. That sounds great. I'm really intrigued. Now I want to go get a La Brusca. I mean, I, I just had that headache hangover from the perception of the 60s and 70s, and now I want to give it a try. Um, all right, I'm going to go back to uh, comments here, and because they're just flowing in. Um, Beverly Aslan, what are you drinking, Christina? Oh, so we are going to get to that, Bev, because we're going to get to what's in her glass next. Andrea Shapiro is here from Ottawa. Um, uh, Anne Bedard says, wow, impressive info. Thank you for that, Christine. Lori Kilmartin says, yes, Frankie Corda made, is made like champagne and same grapes. They do a blanc de blanc and a blanc de noir, like champagne as well. A lot of the wineries I visited in Italy are now using machines to turn the bottles. They actually put a whole pallet in and rotate it. Mm. That's what's happening in champagne as well. But yep. you still get that hand riddling. Um, Andrea Shapiro says, hi, Natalie and Christine. Love learning about the different... Uh, types of Italian sparklers. All right, cool. Okay, so nice segue. Thank you for the question there, um, Andrea, about what is in Christine's glass. So we're going to turn now to what is in your glass, Christine? This is a Fino Sherry. Excellent. So you have written about that for the Globe and Mail. So Sherry has been, um, again, had this uh, hangover image as... I don't know, your grandmother's wine or an Oxford Dawn wine, you know, just an, um, a past generation's wine. I should be careful of my language. But what, yes. what is happening now with Sherry that is kind of giving it a revival? You know, it's really funny because I think what's interesting is that for the past five or 10 years, everyone has been saying Sherry's been having a comeback because everybody's into the Spanish restaurants and you drink your, you eat your tapas and you have a little glass of Sherry with it and cocktail bartenders are using Sherry as a modifier in cocktails. But, you know, all the trend spotters should have phoned up the people in Jerez and told them that this was going on because the sales were not sh reflecting that. They were not picking up at all. And in fact, Sherry was still continuing to lose in sales every year. I wrote an article a few years back that I argued that 
the the uh, whiskey business was you know keeping sherry in business more than drinking sherry because they people wanted the barrels afterward to age their whiskey in and then there was just finally after all this time of saying it's back it's back it's back the sherry sales kind of went up about a year and a half or two years ago hmm. and why was that like what what was the resurgence i mean it can't be just marketing was there a new style or something came through I can't say for sure, but it did seem to coincide with people getting really excited about the Anrama expressions. So Anrama. Uh, yeah. Tell us about what what is that? Anrama. Okay. I have a bottle of um I loved this so much when I tried this in Spain that when I came home I bought can you see the bottle there? Hold it up closer to your okay. camera. There yeah. and a little up. Yeah. If you go up there you go. Now we can see the label. Yes. Okay, Tio Pepe on Rama. All right. I taste of it when I came home because I just loved it so much. It is a seasonal product and essentially they call it, it's a raw sherry and Rama means like from the branch or directly from, you know, that that's the sort of idea. And I guess in some ways you could kind of link it to the natural and organic wine movement because it's kind of similar. Um, but what it is, is that there's a when they're aging the sherry, there's a layer of yeast that they call floor that keeps um, certain sherries from getting over oxidized. So some sherries are oxidized and other sh sherries are not. And um, uh, after they filter all of the, the yeast out and then bottle it, and that's when you get a pheno or a manzanilla, um, okay. depending on, that's a regional distinction. So, um, so the filtration of the yeast is the standard way that you would do that. And it's a little like if you think of a, a chill filtered whiskey that people just don't want to run across a little bit of, you know, yeast bit in their wine. They want it all clean and clear. Yes. But apparently when somebody was at Tio Pepe one day, um, they tasted out of the barrel, which means that the yeast is still there and it's still in the glass a little bit. And they said, this is better than the other expression. You should figure out a way to bottle this. And then they did. And so I think they've been doing that. Um, they've been doing that for a while, but it, it's only recently become more available outside of, it was in England and Spain at first, and now it's starting to come to North America. So they're so, keeping that floor, that cap on there, and you can taste that yeasty do you is it a, a solid thing that you're actually sort of getting bits and chunks as you drink or <laughs> no they so the the floor they still have to fil filter some of it out oh. it's just that it's not very meticulously filtered so there's some yeast that's getting into your wine and a much higher percentage than there was before yeah. and and so what's interesting about it, I mean, and this is all really about kind of having been there and tried both and being like, okay, I really love the Tio Pepe Fino. This is great. But I really love the Tio Pepe Fino on Roma. And, you know, you just find yourself reaching for the one that draws you back over and over again. So anyhow, um, I, it, the idea is that the yeast dies in the glass and then it adds extra protein and that protein gives it a sort of a more buttery kind of sensation and um and it really has a kind of umami pull for me that you know i can really taste like sort of a, a difference in the body and the flavor and it's remarkable and it's addictive oh yes sign me up so you said it was seasonal is it available now or does it only certain seasons like spring this will come out it it, it depends on the um, producer. I mean, I also have um, a manzanilla on Rama that you will see in the LCBO occasionally. I think um, this comes in. It may be coming in very soon, something oh. along these lines. Can um, you hold it up toward the yeah, camera? Yeah. Sorry. A little higher? A little higher. <laughs> there yeah. we go. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. And this one is um, uh, also delicious. This is from... Um, the, the manzanillas, I find they tend to have a little bit of salt. So it's like salt and butter together. It's oh, just delicious. And that sounds um, perfect. Yeah. And uh, they, they, they only do two releases per year of this one, I believe. Um, and they only do one release per year of the Tio Pepe on Rama. But between all the different ones doing it, you should be able to find it year round. Huh. Yeah. D I'm... I've got my shopping list for tomorrow. That just sounds so intriguing. I mean, I love the whole concept of umami and um, 
you know, I, I love wines that are unfiltered that still have the stuffing in them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, the particulate, it's, it adds to the taste, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Let's uh, go dive back into these uh, comments here. And um, Andrea says, oh, yes, thanks, Lori. I was going to ask. Um, Neil Phillips says, Sherry remains one of the best absolute values when you consider the retail price versus the winemaking effort. There's one in the LCBO system now, yes, available online in cases of six. Neil, what one is that? Do you want to post that? Which whatever one of that one is, um, I would love to know because that's uh, something I need to check out tomorrow. Stat. <laughs> um, so that is amazing. So, do you think this new raw style, natural style of sherry is going to save the sherry category, Christine? Well, the thing that the reason that I think it did is that if you look at the uptick in sales um, that the sherry industry finally experienced after all this time, the two categories were Fino and Manzanilla. Hmm. So it's not as though the Unrama is, um, you know, the only thing that people are drinking, but I think it drives people's interest in those two products. So you buy an Unrama, you fall in love with it. Maybe you don't have the Unrama next time, but you're like, hey, this is really good too. <laughs> That's so great. it seems to be working a little. Yeah, absolutely. And what would you pair with it? What would be your favorite food pairings for an Anrama, especially? I think just the Spanish ham is the way to go with that. Hmm. You know, the Fino and the Manzanilla, they're just perfect with that kind of salty meat. That sounds yeah. great. Wow. Yeah. All right, then. Wow. Um, Okay, so let us move on to Pisco. We um, usually yeah. focus on wine here, but um, you are a cocktail and spirits writer as well, so I didn't want to miss the opportunity to talk about one of your favorite stories about Pisco. We know Pisco sour, or some of us do, so maybe slide us into Pisco gently here. What is a Pisco sour cocktail? Oh, a Pisco sour cocktail is, I think, maybe the best cocktail ever. I mean, it's it's just really solid and perfect every single time if it's made correctly. It's just lime, egg white, sugar, and pisco. Um, and that's it. And, you know, you shake it over ice and you strain it. And then you add a little bit of Angostura bitters at the end. And if you do it right, it should have a really frothy top. And it should be both, you should feel sort of the dry tannins from the, from the wine-based spirit. And in addition to it, this like punchy acidity. It's just like... It's, it's like, I, I don't really like lemon meringue pie, but it's like what I wish lemon meringue pie tastes like. I <laughs> love lemon meringue pie. Yeah. Good way to put it. Um, okay. So let's um, move back then. What is, pis, pi, it's Pisco mm. with an E, like they, we say Pisco? Yeah. Yeah. Pisco. Okay. Exactly. Right. So what is that like if we have it straight up or neat or what is it? What, it, what is it? How is it made? What does it taste like? Have you ever had a grappa? Yes. Okay. Do you find it really harsh? In, yes. Or, yeah, right. So um, I think that Pisco is like a, a much more easy drinking, friendly or more approachable version of a grappa. Okay. And it's not made exactly the same way as a grappa. So that's one of the difference. But essentially, the, the, the basic principles of it, it's an unaged grape brandy. So or an unaged grape distillate. Um, and so it's sort of similar. It's in the same family as a grappa. Huh. And so what would be the flavors of a straight up Pisco? Like what would you be getting? Is it a, is it a floral flavor, a lime flavor? Like what are you getting out of this if you don't mix it in a cocktail? It depends an awful lot on what type of grape is being used. So there are um, blended Piscos, which uh, are ten which tend to be the sort of Pisco that you should really be reserving for cocktails. They're still quite high quality spirits, but um, they're not generally suitable for straight sipping. Um, and then there's the Puro Piscos, and those are the pure ones. And basically that just means single varietal. So it's the expression of one single grape. And within that category, there are, I know it sounds confusing, two different types and, and one they call the Puro and the other one they call, um, uh, or sorry, the other one, I'm having trouble thinking of the name, but the other one is made from aromatic grapes. Okay. Okay. And, and so you can have a very straight grape brandy flavor, 
or you can have one that's that's much more aromatic and floral depending on which varietal it is and why did you get fascinated with this story why why did you choose to write about it in the in the globe mail um you know, I, I because probably because my dad grew up in Latin America and because I used to go um, occasionally, we went, we spent a lot of time in Central America and some in South America where he grew up. I've always felt kind of drawn to it. I don't know, maybe a lot of people feel like, oh, I, maybe I should have been born there, you know, where their parents came from. And, and I just, I really like um, that culture. I like the food. I like the drink. And, and so, so I went, went to Peru and um, I did, I, I spent a fair bit of time there. And one of the things I did is I went to Ica, which is where they make a lot of um, Pisco. And then I, 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 you learn this really interesting thing whenever you go to a place that it's a really kind of intellectually interesting spirit because they have to distill it to proof. Um, and what they, does that mean to proof? Um, you know, I can't remember the exact level, but you're, you're not adding water after to change the way it tastes, right? So you're, okay. you're bringing it up, you get really one shot to make this piece go perfect. Okay. And then you're not aging it in wooden barrels. It is it, it is in um age like very sort of briefly in a ferment in a tank in a stainless steel tank. But um, by definition in Peru, no wood. And you know, you think how many spirits get their flavors from wood? Right. And you know, they get their caramel, they get their vanilla, vanilla, they get their, you know, and this is one where it's like, forget it. So this is a pure expression of a fermented and a distilled grape. There, if you buy a puro, it's just one grape. There's no blending, you know? And so it's really kind of an interesting exercise because they got to nail it. And right. yeah, absolutely. And, and when you talk about terroir and spirits, Sometimes it can be a little bit of a weird concept because you're reducing it to nothing and then turning it back into a liquid. But here you've got this spirit that really reflects the place where it was grown because you haven't, you know, added anything. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Um, and so I don't write about spirits, so I'm probably mistaken in this, but the only thing I've heard about proof was like, you know, they would burn a candle or something and if the flame burned so long, it was proof of how much alcohol was in the spirit. That was the origin. But mm. proof, does it translate to like double or half of what the alcohol level is? So if a whiskey is 40%, then is proof 20 or 80, something like that? I think it's double, is it? Yes, exactly. It's double. Okay. That's it's right. Double. 40%, okay. 80 proof. Exactly. Just yeah. For us wine types who are not used to all this <laughs> right. proof and alcohol. <laughs> just clarifying. All right. So that is so cool. So let me just dive back into um, Facebook here. Alejandro says, Pisco uh, is an original from Peru, but here in Chile, we make it on our own. It is the most popular liqueur, liquor there is. You can drink it in many ways, straight up on the rocks, mixed, etc. with my favorite, which is sour with mint. Mm, huh. oh, that sounds good. Yeah. Um, Neil Phillips says, Sherry reminds me of the, okay, yes, we acknowledge that. And let us go down here. Neil Phillips says, it's a more approachable than grappa. It's an interesting way of putting it. Love the sours, drink them often when in Chile or Peru, not enough here. And Lori Kilmartin is asking Christine, what grape do they use for the Pisco? Um, well, so there are, I think that there are I seem to recall that there are 10 or 12 different ones that are used regularly. When I went, which is a while ago, there was a company called Pisco Portone and they had one from each grape. And I believe that there were 12 different varietals, but one of them was a must. So, and one of them was a blend. So I think that's 10. Um, I have a Cabranta here, which is from La Caravedo, which is in Do you want the- Do hold it up? Yeah, there you go. Ooh, Can you yep. see it even though it's glass? Yeah. Yep. Yep. It's in the LCBO right now. Um, and this is actually the new incarnation of Portone, which is one of the places that I visited when I was there. And that's made from a Cabranta grape. Um, and um, that is a non aromatic grape. But then there are nine other ways that it could happen. And I also have a Torrentel here, which is the same company. 
And that is a much more aromatic grape. Um, you could also, they're also made from uh, Muscat, Italia, um, uh, and I'm, I think it's called Common Black. I'm sorry, I'm not good with all of the different grapes, but- That's um, okay, you're ahead of us. <laughs> So would you drink this just as a cocktail or would you actually enjoy Pisco like these single veritals with a meal? Would you pair them with food? You know, I'm not really a huge fan of pairing spirits with food except for cheese and chocolate. Okay. I always pick um, wine to go with a meal. I just think, for personally, I just think it, it works better. I mean, there are a few things that you might have appetizers or desserts tend to be where I would put a spirit. And this would go perfectly with a cheese plate. And is that the proper glass that you have there? Like the um, little glass? Yeah, I'm using this also for my sherry, but this oh, is a, this right. is a, but this is actually the Pisco that I have here. I'm okay. drinking with the Branta. I switched. I have two drinks. I'm double fisting. But, You're so um, thorough for your <laughs> for your readers. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is uh, just a Glencairn glass, which is a pretty standard spirits huh. glass. Okay, cool. Awesome. All right. Wow. So many. We've covered so much. Uh, yeah. As Elaine says, oh my gosh, so much great info. Great interview. Not long enough time, I know. <laughs> Christine, it's already quarter to the hour. So Ooh. I know. Did it zip by? Um, yes. Have we not covered anything that you would like to mention at this point? Um, yeah, I, you know, I really, really have enjoyed the sort of more unusual, the off the, the beaten path things that I've tried. I, I, I love Europe, obviously Europe has some of the best wines in the world, but um, you know, I was in Puerto Vallarta recently and I'm just like now obsessed with Mexican wine and I wanna know all about it. And uh, like, that's actually the thing I wanna find out the most about right now. I just think that um, emerging wine regions are so fascinating. Yeah, and you're a great storyteller. Speaking of that, hold up your book, the one that oh, yeah. uh, you have graciously agreed to offer as a prize. It's available um, on, I would say, online and in bookstores. And what is the title? America Walks Into a Bar. Okay, and what's the subtitle? It's a, a spirit, it's a mouthful. It's a spirited history of tavern saloons, speakeasies, and grog shops. Awesome. That sounds great. Published by Oxford University Press. So it's available. It sounds like there are many great stories in that book, Christine. And you're working on a new book, if I understand correctly. Yeah, I am. That's right. Right good. now. Awesome. As soon well, as I finish this, I'm going back to it. Oh, good. Wow. Dedication. <laughs> All right. Well, Christine, where can people find you online? And, and we've already said where your book is available online or in retailers. Where can we find you online? I'm at uh, christinesismondo.com. Um, awesome. I'm on Twitter at at Sismondo. If you want to go to Instagram, I'm at at Mondo Sismondo. Awesome. Well, Christine, thank you so much for joining us here tonight. That was entirely delightful. I love the stories. I love discovering all of these. I'm motivated now. I've got a shopping list of, of things I want to try <laughs> over the holidays. Thanks to you. So th thank you for spending time with us here on the Sunday Sipper Club tonight. Thank you so much. It was a lot of fun. Oh, awesome. That's great. Okay. <laughs> Cheers for now. We'll talk again in the future. <laughs> great. Have a great night. Okay. You too, Christine. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Thanks. <laughs> All right, folks, please hang on because we are not done. I'm going to draw for the winner of last week's um, contest. And um, that would be a, uh, let me just bring up my um, things here. So, the winner of last week's contest, and I'll just acknowledge some, um, sorry, I'll just get this working here, and there we go. Okay, so uh, Paul says, please post a list of Sherry's Tasted Tonight. Just ordered uh, the book on Amazon as a gift. That's nice, Linda. Very enjoyable interview, list of spirits. Sam Hawk is here, James you know, you guys are joining late, but that's okay. You can watch the replay. All right. Um, and what else have we got down here? Melanie Lloyd. Thanks, Christine, for a great interview, says Jim Clark and Neil Phillips. All right. So the winner last week 
um, who are we talking to? <laughs> now I got to draw for the prize and I've got to keep track of my own, um, schedule here. But the winner is Marie Walsh. I don't think she's online tonight, Marie Walsh. I've got a couple of other winners that I need to connect with from previous weeks. So we will do that this week. Um, but Marie Walsh, you are the winner of something. <laughs> it's the book from last week. Who did we have last week? Somebody remind me. Oh my goodness. I'm in the midst of launches for the wine and cheese course. That's Wednesday, by the way, if you're interested. The podcast and uh, the audiobook just came out for Red, White, and Drunk All Over. I mean, so much is going on. My mind is spinning like all those plates, uh, trying to keep everything uh, top of mind. So, so my friends, um, Wednesday I'll be opening up registration for the Wine and Cheese course. The audiobook has launched. Yay, that went well. And um, yeah, the podcast will launch December 5th. Wednesday, December 5th. So much on the go. Marie Walsh, congratulations. You're in Halifax, Nova Scotia, I believe. So you have won the prize for tonight. And uh, we will be back next week with Sarah Partniak, who writes for Toronto Life magazine and other publications about wine spirits. All right. Oh, yes, Melanie, thank you. It's the Wine Super Taster Kit. Marie, you've won the Wine Super Taster Kit from Gary Pickering at Brock University. So you can find out if you are a Super Taster, Marie. All right. So thank you for your share. And uh, yes, Lori and Andrea and Anne. Uh, keep sharing this video. Take an opportunity now. Shannon, the internet has been glitchy, yes. Take an opportunity now at the end as we wrap up. Share the video tell your friends and family why you're sharing the video and you could win a signed copy of Christine Sismondo's book about bars and speakeasies. Great stories inside that book, even if you're watching the replay. All right, guys. Oh, Paul, he just found Unquenchable in the bookstore. Excellent. Down in Virginia. Yay. All right. <laughs> okay, guys, I will see you next week. Same time, same bat place right here at 6 p.m. Eastern. Talk to Sarah next week. Take care. Bye-bye for now.